And Sato's Place is brought to you by... It's our long-awaited Fairfax special. You're going to see one of the most unique studios in the world. We've got a brand new ITL. You're at the place. It's been Sato's Place. That was one of the best yays I've done in a long time. Classic. That was mellifluous. 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 There we go. <laughs> I got you covered. Thanks. <laughs> That's See, right. Oxycontin. Well, man. you got an Ebonics issue. Oh, yeah, Molly's hot. This is my Molly. <laughs> okay, cool. That's right. You're an, you're an EDM dude. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can man. dream, can I? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, absolutely. thanks, man. Thanks for not stepping and ruining that. Hey, guys, great to have you with us. Uh, this is going to be a very special, unique show. Herbert? Uh, it is. This we, was cool, wasn't it? We, we did. We spent a, a great time with Mike and Andrew Nera. Thanks for that, our Vintage King family. Mm -hmm. uh, Kevin Agunas, who's brilliant, who has got Godier signed to Fairfax and mixed the last Lumineers record. And we got a chance to look at this temple. So I say, let's get right to the homework and let's get to the temple. What do you think? Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. So we don't want to waste any time with you guys. It is great to see you as usual. We are coming to you from the Art Institute of California, Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. You guys have been wonderful with social media. Keep liking and subscribing. Um, our Avid special is coming up in a couple of weeks where we do Pro Tools 11. And this Vintage King special again, which we just mentioned, um, great partners of ours. By the way, they still have that special on. If you go to uh, vintageking.com forward slash Pensado, the checkout code is, is Pensado. You get 5% off of the demo gear stuff. One more week for that, so make sure you go there. We, we, this is a really full show. Um, we're excited about these guys. We thank Kevin Agunas for bringing Absolutely. us in. Um, and by the way, Bob Curtin, who came out of our little facility here, uh, is still an intern over there, so we love having Bob over there. Check the special out. You're going to enjoy it. We've got a cool ITL for you, and then we'll go right into the special. Dave, why don't you introduce the ITL? Yeah. Uh, every once in a while, I get, I get my hands on something that just blows me away, and uh, I, I want to share those with you like I always have. Uh, this is a great ITL. Check it out. Hey, guys. I've been putting these new Isotope RX3 plugins through their paces, and they're pretty spectacular. Um, they're so good that they're going to save you a lot of time and money and they'll pay for themselves pretty quickly. We've all gotten audio and, and created tracks where it was like, man, if I could just fix this, I could keep this as my best performance. Or uh, in my case, a lot of times I'll get tracks from a client and, and there'll be some little issues like I'm on, I might want to take some of the background noise out. From time to time, we even use these plugins on our show. That's how much we think of them. This new series of RX3 plugins, it's, it's, it's a, an upgrade from the R, RX2 plugins. Man, they've rewritten everything from the ground up. These things are six times faster, they're more efficient, so you don't have to worry as much about being processor intensive. In fact, uh, I haven't really worried about it too much at all, uh, particularly if you're using a standalone version. We all have had a situation where we liked the guitar performance, there was a little bit of hum in there, um, I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna show you something in a minute that just freaks me out. Uh, we had a, a triangle inside a guitar part. We took the triangle out and left the guitar. There's there's a one that has a clipping declipping function that, that's pretty spectacular. Um, really works well. There's one that will even take um, clipping and, and improve that pretty significantly. Now, in, in, in the post-production world, uh, I think you guys are going to really fall in love with these plugins. Uh, it, it'll re way, way, way reduce the amount of ADR you need to do, um, any kind of live recording uh, location that gets extraneous noises. You can just clean all that up. So enough. Let's just let's ju jump right in right now. Okay, so now I've got this piece of audio. We've, in, we've brought it into the plugin ahead of time. Check out this gap. If it was in time, I'd keep it. All right, so now I'm gonna highlight the part that I want to replace. All right, let's come over here and, and select Spectral Repair. Now we've got several choices up here for what we're doing now. We can use Replace. Replaces, um, we'll just connect these two and kind of smooth out the harmonics right in here. 
pattern will actually is smart. It, could, it, it actually creates these neat things for us. Okay, so now once we've got all these parameters uh, selected and we've tested and tried to find which, which was the best, let's hit process. Okay, so looks pretty good. Looks can be deceiving. That's pretty good. Now, we can massage it even more and you can get these things like, uh, depending on, on how much you select, there's so many variables, you can do so much with this plugin, but we've, we've repaired this. And uh, now I'm gonna show you something that's even more spectacular. Okay guys, check this guitar part out. Oh, I love that guitar part. What's that triangle doing in my guitar part? It's a good looking triangle. Now look guys, this is the triangles right here, the way this spectrograph works. Now what we can do is we can come over here this tool works pretty cool. Now we can we can highlight this one, hold shift key down. Let's highlight as many of the harmonics as we can. Now what this spectrograph is showing us is that a sound is composed of harmonics. And you can see they kind of fade out. So rather than go through all the time to do this, you select them. Here's some here's some little subtle ones. Might want to select that. Here's a little guy here. The more, more of these you take time to get out, uh, the better you are. That last one, you don't want to do that. Okay, so here's before. Now, here's, here, let's bring up our sp spectral repair. Okay, now this time what we're trying to repair is we're trying to take something out. So we click the attenuate. Once again, Isotope has made it pretty easy. These, these starting points are very, very good. Massage these and work with those, and, 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 and it might take you one or two tries, but you, the more you experiment with these plugins, the more uses you'll find for them. So hit the process button. Now, to save a little bit of time, I've got the one that I already did. I right, checked this out. <laughs> this is amazing. I swear to you, that's incredible. I can't believe it's gone, and I did it. All right, now let's move on. This is a plugin called D Reverb. This thing's got a ton of usages. I like it just as much adding reverb as I do taking it out. I've got this loop. Let's say I want to add my own ambience to this loop. Here's the loop. All right, bring up the plug-in. I got a little preset going here for us. Check this. <laughs> I love it when stuff works. Now we can, we can. Okay, watch these yellow bars. I can, this is the amount of reduction. This is a low, mid, high, mid, high. Now. You can do a lot of watch this when I watch when I pull this reduction. Now we're gonna actually start adding ambience. Watch this. You'll notice these the little the, the yellow bars 
start moving up. Now let's take, let's watch. Tons and tons and tons of usable things. Now, if you just want to hear the ambience, watch this. That's what it's taken out. Man, I can think of a million things to do with that one. I could play with this one all day, but I guess we better move on. This is back when I was in a really large room. My first control room was, was pretty big that I had at home. And we were, we were picking up a lot of room in my mic. Watch this. Hey, how you doing? Welcome to this week's Into the Lair. I appreciate you watching us last week. We had the... Uh... What did we have? Don't really know, Dave. Now, now this plug-in, I, really, I didn't really change much. Man, these things are so smart. Watch. Hey, how you doing? Welcome to this week's Into the Lair. I appreciate you watching us last week. We had the... Uh... <laughs> I sound like a moron. I almost went anti-PC there for a minute. Hey, how you doing? Welcome to this week's... In hey, how you doing? Welcome to this week's... In hey, how you doing? Welcome to this week's... In hey, how you doing? Welcome to this week's... In hey, how you doing? Welcome to this week's... In hey, how you doing? Welcome to this week's... In hey, how you doing? Welcome to this week's... In hey, how you doing? Welcome to this week's... In hey, how you doing? Welcome to this week's... In hey, you Man, that'll, that'll drive you crazy. But can you imagine if you've got a duet the singer sung it across the world somewhere in a big ambient room. The male singer, the, the, the female singer recorded it at, at Larrabee, a real nice room. And, and you're trying to match them and make them sound like they're part of the same song. Just strip the ambience off of both and then add your own ambience. And man, you're, you're rocking. So many different things you can do with this. Uh, Say so your guitar is a little ambient. Just because it's, it's dialogue doesn't mean you have to use it for dialogue. You can use it for lots of different stuff. Oh, I've got to show you this one before we leave, guys. Bear with me. This thing is a, a declipper. Now, check this out. This thing was kind of crunchy. Be sure and listen to the end. Now, watch this. Cool. I don't think I changed this, did I? I think I just pulled it up and it worked right out the box. Watch this. Oh my goodness, man. All right, so now we've looked at the plug-in versions. We've looked at the standalone versions. They're, they're the same. Uh, sometimes I use the standalone if it's a, an intense processor thing and it's just a one-off fix it. I would do that. And then sometimes within the process of the song, you want to hear it in context. So it might be that, that you couldn't get something repaired exactly perfect but that something is landing on a beat with a kick drum or a snare hitting at the same time and 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 and, and so you might want to keep it so there's there's times when you'd use both um all i gotta tell you is that it, i'm just impressed not because it does what it does because it does so much more so all you guys in post uh broadcast uh this is tailor made for you guys those of us that that make records i could see using this every day I'm telling you, it just, it just, first, it just, just, they're just incredible. I love it, love it, love it. Great job, Isotope. All right, guys, next week. Kevin Algunas and Andrew and Mike from Vintage King. A lot of history in this place. You can feel it the minute you walk in. The smell embodies everything that's cool and right about this room. Kevin, it's 
this is going to be a cologne available for uh, release through Vintage King, <laughs> right? This smell? Yeah. yeah. We're going to bottle it, it up. a little uh, Thai food and B.O. and it'll be a perfect studio smell. Uh, Lumineers done in this room? Uh, well, we mixed the record here and we did some vocals and some overdubs in here, yes. Oh. Uh, let's, let's get a little tour and get a little bit of the history we woven into this tour. So, the mic collection, pretty impressive, pretty impressive. Are these mostly yours or a combination of what, what you inherited when you bought the room? Uh, they're mostly mine. And um, what's out is usually stuff we go to fairly regularly. There's other stuff put away. But um, yeah, these are mics uh, I've collected over the years. Uh, most of them actually uh, I purchased through Vintage King. You know, we've had a, mm -hmm. a, a good 15 year relationship. And wow. so many times Michael just send me microphones to, to check out and listen to, and, and I'll kind of swap things out as I, I see fit or need for different projects. Yeah, that was the cool thing. Day, for, with Kevin you know, and our relationship, we used to, back in, gosh, day one, Kevin would try to sift through. He'd say, Mike, how many 47s do you have? And you know, and if we could do it, we'd send two, three, four out at a time. And Kevin would kind of pick the cream of the crop. And then he'd keep doing that over time with more and more of them and result in probably his favorite of, you know, more than a dozen or trying out a dozen or 15 47s over the years, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Everyone's different. Yeah. It's not, it's not a exactly. good or a better, it's just everyone's different. There's a different personality aptitude. that you're looking for, yeah. right? One's purple, one's blue, one's red. It's yeah. not better or worse, it's just right. what's appropriate. Yeah. So much history in this room, in case uh, people aren't aware of some of the history in this room, <laughs> um, this, this was part of Sound City, this was Sound City, and Kevin took it over, and to his credit, he preserved it and enhanced it and, um, whoa, what the hell is that, Kevin? Is that a... Oh, the mic over yeah. the kit? This is an old RCA KU3A, or some people call them a 10,001. I've heard that, that term used, but um, this is a, yeah, it's a beautiful old ribbon mic that uh, is probably one of the favorite, my favorite microphones that I own. And uh, I've been told technically it's broken. Whenever I've taken it up to West Dooley to repair, they'll kind of look at it and go, uh, we, need, we need to fix this thing. These, and I won't let them touch it. Right. These drums, is this where after the gold rush, the drums were recorded? Is this where Tom Petty did his drums? Is, is... You know, the, the Petty drums were usually done in that far corner. Those okay. records we'll were, be over there in a second. were kind of baffled down. You know, that's, oh. that was kind of the era of the dead sounding record. Uh -huh. um, so the Petty records, uh, from, from all the pictures I've seen, were more, were more deadened and they were in that corner. But this is the drum spot for the majority of the records Nirvana? that were done here. Nevermind was right here. Um, the, the later spot. petty stuff like uh, Wildflowers and stuff like that was here. The more open sounding stuff the that Rick Rubin trick, did. Cheap Trick, that kind of stuff. Uh, cheap Trick, um, Rage Against the Machine, um, all that kind of stuff. The so majority of, I think, what this room is known for, drum-wise, yes. is, is in the spot. spot. Yeah. yeah. So this is, I mean, you feel it's the sweet spot then, <laughs> obviously. When yeah. you talk here, you can hear yeah, it. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. It's, 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 it's really can't right. you. Hey, yeah. 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 Imagine that. Yeah. It depends what you're into. There's a couple good spots, for right. sure. I've, I've recorded drums in a couple spots, but this right. is definitely the, the classic position right. for the room. Let's check out the keyboards. Yeah. So the reason the keyboards are here is because if you move them, they get out of tune. So the keyboards, is this the best spot for the keyboards to record? Uh, it's not necessarily the best spot, but it's a, it's a really good spot. There's a couple of spots that would work. Yeah. It's more ergonomics that it worked having them all over here and not wanting to move them so they wouldn't go out of tune. I guess the question, is there a bad spot in this room? I mean, you and I were talking earlier, walking around, and it seems like every area has a cool sound to it. It's, there's no bad spots in the room. Yeah, yeah, no, it's pretty even, even sounding room. Um, it, it sounds good just about it, everywhere. It, it almost, it's almost kind of ironic that the room was not actually, in quotation marks, designed, but yet it's still one of the best rooms in the world. Is that a slight against designers, or is it that uh, an advertisement for just sheer luck? Well, one, I don't know for sure, because I, I don't claim to be an acoustician or, or know the, the scientific uh -huh. parameters of all that. I do know that people have tried to recreate this room, uh -huh. uh, measured it, taken all the materials and, and tried to recreate it and Couldn't. not succeeded. But um, in, in <laughs> my humble opinion, I think it does have to do with materials, but it also has to do with what's on the other side of the walls. So I'm sure oh. if, 
if you walked out these doors and it was just cinder block building, right. probably sound really different. These walls are kind of very much paper mache walls, so there's a certain amount of frequencies leaving yeah. and not coming back. Hmm. This wall looks to me like it's angled, yeah. really original. Yeah, I don't know exactly what year they they um, cladded it. Cladded it. It's like that lath and plaster type uh, wood. But I, I think that was done probably in the 70s. Mm. It looks um, like a lot of photos. Did you yeah. say it's at an angle? Mine? It is. It, it's because you think in, on, you know, if you drew this out on paper, it's kind of a square room. You wouldn't think it sounds good, but that wall is at a bit of an angle. It's it just, sure it is. Just isn't sounds it? great just talking in here. Yeah. Man, this is a B3 is, is the greatest rock keyboard ever invented. Is that a 147? Uh, this is a 122. Oh, 122. Even yeah. Cooler. Yeah, good old, good old Leslie. Um, yeah, I love this thing. We use it all the time. And the upright, is it, is it tacked out or is it... This, the upright is not. We've kind of hardened the hammers a little bit so it sounds a little more oh, tacky. Yeah. But um, we do have the, the tacks oh. that you can lower down and, oh, and kind of cool. get that sound. That's beyond so it becomes cool. two different pianos. This, the, the Grand is a, an amazing piano. This has been here, I think, as long as the studio has. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's a really special sounding grand piano. When I first moved in here, I called up a friend of mine, uh, Ben Montench, who's the keyboard player in oh. the Heartbreakers. And I told him, I'm like, Ben, I, I think I'm gonna move into Sound City. You know, what do you, what do you think? And the first thing he said, he's like, do not let that piano leave the room. <laughs> and, and sure it's, enough, we kept it. And, stayed. Yeah, we actually just did a photo shoot in here last week. He's got a solo record coming out, and so we wanted oh. to. But it's a, it's a great sounding piano. It's got a lot of attack for a, a grand piano. What's interesting, I think, with all of us, and especially in Kevin's collection, is obviously he has an amazing collection of guitars, keyboards, drums, microphones, and all that. It's the source of it, you know? So we all want to record and create these great sounding recordings, but if the guitar doesn't sound great, or maybe the keyboard doesn't, but Kevin is obviously pretty eclectic in the sense where he's collected an amazing collection of great sounding instruments that makes it a lot more fun because you have this historic, you know, inventory to choose from, or, you know, it's just, it's amazing. It seems to me that, uh, that one of the things that you feel in this room is the importance of the musician, the importance yeah. of collaboration. The, yeah. you, when, when Kevin was describing some of the songs that were created here, you get a vision of people playing together in a room and that yeah. being captured and, and, and ending up coming into your ears and, and you feel the room, you feel the passion, yeah. you feel the connectedness. Yeah. Um, and the technology doesn't interfere with that, it enhances it. Right. Technology is a wonderful thing, but sometimes technology can be the star and not the person manipulating the technology. And this room is, is somewhat of a shrine to to that well, concept, isn't it, Kevin? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the whole idea here is really to put the the um, put it on the musician and not the technology, like right. make them make the art, not have the technology right. make the art. You know what I mean? You feel that. If you watch the movie Sound City and you know Kevin's career and the artists he's doing now in this room with Fairfax, it's all about the song, the playing. It's naked. And and not, and leaving a lot of space and you know listen to all that I was talking about in, in the in the movie Sound City and listen you know to Kevin as a producer and just knowing his style, it's just it's all about the song and the performance and having like my brother saying, these great instruments to play on so on and the source, just dial in on the song the the performance the sound of the instruments and just capture it right with great gear and it you don't have to do a lot of manipulation to that if that is all there yeah you know yeah. yeah. Just trying to, to set a, um, set a, no pun intended, but set a stage and create an environment where the musician can be as successful as possible in what they're trying to mm -hmm. convey in their art. It seems to me there's two types of food. The food that you, you just pick a great fresh piece of meat and you grill it perfectly and you taste it and it's the best steak you ever had. It's, it's just steak and the steak is the star. And then there's the Bobby Flay side of things where you pile on all kinds of spices and you do all this. And, and the cooking is the star and the meat tastes just as good. It's just, it's not the star, the process, the flavors, the, 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 the spices becomes the star. And I think they're both very valid ways to work. And I think 
the uniqueness about this room is you can have your choice about doing either one. Right. Sometimes technology limits you, which is a good thing, but it's hard to undo technology. This room, you can go either way. Right. Yeah. No, I think that's very true. This takes a lifetime of collecting. Well, if, you you've, know, got, if you've got the Vintage King black card, yeah. <laughs> uh, which, which Kevin had originally. <laughs> he created it. That takes time. You know, it takes time. There's so much. That's the cool thing about vintage gear in essence. It does all have character and it all takes time to experiment with and find, like, as we were having a conversation earlier, to find what really suits your taste or suits the music or your personality. You know, what is it that, that you find unique in each, each piece of gear? I think that metaphorically vintage gear kind of has the essence of the people that used it in it i know that sounds a little bit corny but i think you feel <coughs> something from vintage gear that allows you to usurp a little bit of the ability of the person that preceded you sure right. like we're guitar players and i swear yeah. to you i can pick up a guitar and tell if someone yeah. really crummy played it or if someone great played it yeah if it's at least 30 years old you can feel it can't you this is an old old Mellotron Mark II we picked up oh, years ago. Man, um, there's a lot of sample libraries of these things now, but uh, they're really fun. The, the The right side is all lead sounds. Like Here, the flutes I was playing, and then the left side is all what they call fills and, and rhythm tracks. Um, so these things are. Let me stop you real quick. Every time you hit the key, uh, it triggers. Uh, an endless tape loop. Yeah. So, well, so we're actually listening to tape. Watch this. Uh, we're let's, actually listening to a number of keys, tape everybody. machines. Oh, so each key, wow. these are all tapes for individual keys. So each time I hit a key, it's just it's activating that tape loop. Yeah, so each key, you're right, each key has its own tape. So uh, I know Gaudier's on your label, uh -huh. uh, Fairfax Recordings. This isn't, this isn't the one they used. They used one in Australia, right? Yeah, um, Gautier made that record himself uh, in his dad's barn. He, built he used a lot there. of Mellotron though, right? He did, yeah. And uh, he, but he made that record all by himself um, using samples and stuff like that and, and did an amazing job, clearly. Right. So he, <laughs> you can actually record your own tapes to play in the Mellotron. You probably could. I've never done it. I'm sure there's a way, though. There has to be. I'm sure you can do it. And that's clearly what they did to build these, was they yeah. went into a studio and, and made all those loops. And this, this thing was made in England, right? Yeah, yeah. This, uh, this was made in England in the 60s. Um, the original, from, from what I understand, the original designer was, was Harry Chamberlain here in L.A. and made the oh. Chamberlains, and then this was based off of the Chamberlain. And in, in we're, we're in a recording studio. The thing's a little loud. Does it have a direct out that you, that you take into the console, or do you mic something? Um, I can do either or. There's speakers on both sides, but I can take a direct out on it. Oh. Um, it's usually not this buzzy. It might be the equipment we have in the room for filming right oh, now. I, I don't see. know, but it's... Uh, it's but it definitely gives not a character. The, yeah, it's definitely not and the quietest it, it, thing in the world. And what's the longest length of time it's ever worked continuously correctly? <laughs> Probably an hour. <laughs> That's pretty yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> this is kind of like owning an old teak sailboat and an old Jaguar all in one. It's it's never a matter of if it fully works, it's managing what doesn't work. Right. You know what I mean? Right. And kind of working around that. Yep. But it makes wonderful sounds. Too cool. Yeah. Let's uh, let's peregrinate over to the guitars. Guys, we, we we left the keyboards. We passed about three things that are incredible. The little Plexi Baldwin, one, the yeah. the, uh, the Rhodes, the... Oh my goodness. But now, <laughs> we're at the star of the show. Guitars, as you know. That's because you're a guitar player. As right? you know. Yeah. All the world is about guitars and guitar playing. Guitar players make the best engineers. <laughs> guitar players make the best lovers. <laughs> guitar players are the pinnacle and the top of the food chain in the music world. They write the best and this, songs too? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> and this collection of guitars, uh, to me, it, it's, it's the best example of every type of guitar and the best example of that model. Take me through it, Kev. Let's start with the 59 Les Paul at the front. There's a 56 behind it. Yeah, that's a 59 Les Paul, 56 Gold Top, 54 Strat, 57 Tele, mm -hmm. and that's a 58 Rickenbacker 360. I think, 
I think uh, in a biblical sense, I think I see Mike coveting one of the Les Pauls. <laughs> this oh, is here. mine right here, if I can take one. No, but Kev, I mean, like, you know, be coming out to visit Kevin once in a while. He let me play this one through an old tweet he has probably about five, six years ago. And it the looks thing, like you should own it. Well, it, it does. It, it, matches, it, matches, it was a gift, it matches actually. your skin color. It He's a curator everything. of a museum, and I'm letting him borrow this. I'll trade thing. you for vintage camp. <laughs> okay, <laughs> for vintage bargain. <laughs> That's a deal, Kev. But, but seriously, when you play it, the way it shines, like when you say, you know, before, you know, you got a soul in something, when you play it, it really, it, something kind of takes over a little for you. And if you're a pretty good player, it makes you feel good about mm -hmm. yourself. And you almost, I'm not saying it makes you a better player, but it does feel good, doesn't it? Just, because yeah. yeah. it's so open and the way it just chimes and rings, it just got sustained. It's, it's unbelievable and the balance on it. Guitars are made out of wood. Wood has cell structure and that cell structure has water in it. It seems like, like as they age, <coughs> that water inside the cell structure must align a certain way. And the true story, when, really back in the day, no, 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 back in the day, okay. we'd buy a newer guitar, we'd set it in front of our speakers and we'd play only the albums we liked with the yeah. guitar sitting in yeah. front of the speakers while we were gone and weren't using it. So for at least a year, the guitar had those vibrations going to it and as the wood dried. I think it dried a certain way, like a Stradivarius sure. violin. Getting in some quantum physics. See, here. I'm not crazy. No. Well, that doesn't prove I'm not crazy. <laughs> but that's, that's spectacular, man. Do you play yeah. guitar? A little bit. I'm a bass player primarily. That's how Ooh. I started. So um, when I when I do play, uh, I usually play bass. I play guitar once in a while, though, if, if we need something on a Tell recording. Tell us about these basses, Kev. Um, just a couple different basses. This is a. Uh, this is an old 67, uh, 4005, I believe it's called. It's a really great Rickenbacker bass. This is one of my favorites I've had for years. This is a 57P bass. Yeah. Uh, this is a 58 Gibson EB2, which is a wonderful bass. Sounds, it's very deep sounding. It sounds like a mini Moog almost in a track. Yeah. Um, a Dan Electro Barry or tenor guitar. Um, like using that for bass sometimes, and then an old Hofner that sounds really Every good. Every time I see the Rickenbacker, I think of Roundabout. Oh, yeah. The first song I remember yeah. having a Rickenbacker by Yes. I always think of the Beatles. Right. Well, yeah. speaking of Beatles, we're missing a bass. I don't see a Hofner. Yeah, right There's right a Hofner right there? With some nice flat but it's not the same. Not the Hofner. It's not the violin bass. No. Yeah. yeah. I can't count that. I, I'm sorry. But, That's um, right, Yeah, so we keep a few few amps around um, that I like and I actually record bass through guitar amps most of the time I like the sound of that's so weird I like I like playing amp. through a 50 watt Marshall bass head there guitar yeah. I like yeah. that. Dwayne Allman played that way I think Jimmy played that way too yeah. Is that an AC30? That's an AC30. That's actually a prototype. That's one of the first 10 That's they ever I, built. I didn't recognize it, but it kind of looked like it. Yeah. So one of their first endorsees was uh, Hank Marvin, if you remember him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that was one of his early amps. No joke. And uh, that's when they, they kind of started figuring out what they were going to do with those. And that's an AC15 from the same era. Wow. Uh, late 50s, early 60s. Viber Lux. So it's a Viber, Viber Verb and a high-powered twin and a low-powered twin. So, Kev, tell us about these acoustic guitars, man. Um, just a collection of guitars that I really like for recording. Uh, old Gibson 12 string. Um, it's an old Sovereign. And uh, a couple old uh, mid 60s Gibsons that sound great. And uh, You like Gibsons? I like Gibsons a lot. I also like Martins. It's, to me, it's like, a, you know, it's like having a Les Paul and a Strat. They're mm -hmm. both great. It just right. depends what you need them for. Yep. These smaller body Martins are great um, when you have bass and drums and something. You don't have to notch out the low end. They kind of they sit, sit, in the sit properly. Is that a zero, 00 series? I never saw one dark brown. This is a triple O. So the, like the O's designate the size of the guitar, right? right? A double O would be more like a dreadnought style. A triple O is a smaller guitar. Um, this is a solid, not solid, but it's all mahogany guitar, so it's going to wow. be a little darker sounding. This is our basic setup uh, most of the time mm -hmm. um, when we're cutting basics with bands. Um, I'll have the guitar player and the bass player go through these, mm -hmm. and most of it is picked up by the, uh, the KU-3A over mm -hmm. the top of the kit. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a, a mic on the kick drum, as you can see. Oh, cool. But uh, most of it is picked up by this overhead mic. And so a lot of the mixing of the guitar, bass, and drums happens in the recording. Like I'll set the volume of these amps mm -hmm. 
to bleed a certain amount into this I microphone. Would argue all the mixing takes place there between the drums and the bass, right? For me, it was years and years of of putting a lot of mics on drum mm -hmm. sets and trying different angles. Mm -hmm. And then when I got to the the console to listen back to the drums, nine times out of ten, I peel everything away except the kick mm -hmm. mic and the mm -hmm. overhead. Yeah. And it, maybe if you have a really dense track, mm -hmm. I'll get a snare mic as a safety just to make sure I can right. make the snare poke through. But what I like about this is if you have a good drummer and somebody who knows what they want to do, uh -huh. you're giving them the opportunity to mix themselves. Because right. if they can just hear that one mic in their headphones, uh -huh. they can adjust their, their velocity and their limbs to... You know, and that's where it also is important too at the selection of the instrument because if a cymbal's too bright and you're trying to mix your hi-hats and just the selection of the drums, the way they're tuned, help how you're gonna mix yourself and just not, you know, over bashing the cymbals and just being delicate and having finesse. And that's the true essence of the foundation of where we learned our recording was to work with the room, work with the instruments in mix yourself. Mm -hmm. With the one microphone on the overhead this is, the, right. is the premise. Was of this the at uh, the white room? Yeah, mm -hmm. the white room. We used one like Kev's doing like one kick drum, one overhead and you go out we go out and tour with the Horde tour or whatever, we would go out with a Bayer 160 overhead and then just a D25 kick drum mic and they'd look at us like, what the fuck are you doing, you know? Like we'd tour the Dave Matthews Band live and uh -huh. do some steam tours and we'd come up uh -huh. with two mics. They thought we were crazy, but we'd say, well, just give it a listen. And they, they couldn't believe how big it is. And that's what I think Kevin's attesting to. It's, it's bigger than life mm -hmm. when you have, when it's this simple because the players actually playing a little, they're playing to the microphone and playing a little softer actually, because they have to mix themselves. Yeah. Right. I, played in a, I played in a band with the original drum from Skinner, the one on Free Bird and Three Steps, and he called yeah. it the drum. He said, right. he said it's, one, it's one instrument. It's not a, it's not a bunch of different right. instruments. Yeah. Right. It's yeah, the that's, drum. That's, and and that's, that even correlates bigger to life, but I mean, in general, with the band, you are one. I mean, even as a bass player, you know, and Kevin could probably test you as a bass player, you know, it's mixing yourself with the drums, making sure you, mm -hmm. you have the essence of that space that's sometimes overlooked where you think you're going to create the space afterwards with editing or mm -hmm. through mixing or EQing, but mm -hmm. it's just, this is beautiful. And Tell me something, Andrew. Well, you, is, you look at that and, and the symmetry of it just seems right, much less the sound. It looks like it should sound right, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Am I kidding? Yeah. I mean, it, it, the symmetry is just perfect. And, yeah. uh, yeah. The other, the other big part of it is, yeah. as you know, being an a amazing mixer, phase problems basically disappear because <laughs> you're not trying to get a bunch of mics in phase, right. and you know what it's like to get a, a, sesh, a session, a session with 13 all. mics and all. trying to get things them all. Things sound bigger yeah. because of that, and, and you can see the drummer you're trying to connect with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you remember listening to old recordings? Well, I mean, I mean, we all do. You listen back to a great '60s recording, and there's nothing going on. There's a lot of space, but everything. But the record sounds so big. Or listen to an old Cat Stevens record. Mm -hmm. There's nothing going on, but everything sounds huge because of the simplicity. And to me, like you're using this KU3A mm -hmm. and picking up. There's just a lot of room for this mic to pick up that magic yeah. and create big sound. The other thing too is because we do a lot of live recording, so there may be a singer out here or another right. guitar player. There's other musicians around the room. They're also mic'd, right? Yeah. So today what's traditional in most modern recordings is to put room mics up. Right. But they didn't do that back then. And mm -hmm. I don't do that so much now. We do mm -hmm. it once in a while. Okay. But if you have a, let's say, a singer playing acoustic right there and facing the drummer, there's a mic on him, that's a room mic. Right. So it's it's the it's the the culmination the and the combination the of, of, of all those things that yeah. make the sound. And you need yeah. to get it right the first time right away, thinking I'm gonna keep that vocal in all those performances and get the blend right then, right? You're mixing everything right then. That's yeah. the right. goal. Yeah. And that you can always hear it, I, th I feel like I can hear it in a recording, when the band, the artist, when they know it's going down right on the spot and mm -hmm. it's going to tape or whatever the medium is, but you're committing, I guess that's the better that's point. Exactly when they know right. you're committing, yeah. there's a certain amount of angst in yeah. the room. There's yeah. a certain amount of nervousness. <laughs> there's butterflies yeah. Yeah. that comes through, especially when you're making rock records. Yeah. But when everybody's super relaxed because they know they have a million takes and everything right. can be manipulated, the, scratch vocal. the energy changes. Yeah. Yeah. It just does. Yeah. Yeah. Not that's, for better or for worse, it's word. just different and yeah. it depends what you're going for. And everybody believes that in the take, the energy does come across what and, you're saying. And you yeah. know what, too, even printing your effects, too. So you're committed to it then, like old Bowie stuff or whatever else. You know, you committed, or if it was the Beatles, you didn't have takes, so you had 
that was it. Right. You, you did your take, you got your performance there. That was your effect. But the beauty of it was that the craft and the art became a true skill in art because you didn't kind of know how to dial it in. You dialed it in because you knew that was it. That was your chance. I mean, it's it's a beautiful expression that is lost. Do you print a lot of delay and yeah. reverb to yeah. your lead vocal tracks, for instance? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Yeah, if it feels right. Look, it's this is one approach, right? And we use this approach a lot. Yeah. Everything's valid. You can do it a bunch of ways. This right. is just one way we do it. But yeah, if it's appropriate, yep. yeah. and I like to try and do that, because to me, no offense, <laughs> mixing is a formality in my world, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Don't hit me. <laughs> you liked it last time. <laughs> <laughs> um, mixing is a formality for me. I'm not a professional mixer, so I'm trying to get as much vibe as I can when I'm tracking, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm hoping at the end of my process, I'm setting levels, maybe adding a little extra reverb right. overall, right. and panning left, center, right? And that's it. And that's it. Beyond that, like... Because you got it right in the room and with the minor adjustments that you make. I think, I think life's better with options. I think that, that something you just said just struck me. Yeah. It's almost like, like Kevin has preserved something that's a part of our childhood, a part of the musical past. Definitely. And he's brought it into relevancy today tomorrow yes, yes. and and that's the that's the beauty of his gift and you were, you were about to apologize for saying something about the world I live in but I like options I, 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 I like I like being able to do this I like being able to do it the way I'm currently doing it right uh, it would be a horrible musical place if, if we didn't have options you right. know absolutely I, I agree with you and I you know, I've seen, and I'm, I know you have too, and you guys have too. Yeah. I have friends that have a four track and a 57 and a 58 right. and make stunning records right. that I wish I could make. I like I it. listen, I have one I friend who mm -hmm. makes records with a four track, a BX10 and a few mics. And I just, I'm jealous, high. right? Yeah. But I also have friends that make records in million dollar studios and make equally amazing, mm -hmm. right. as right. amazing records. They sound different. So the point is it's like, and we were talking about this earlier, there's no specific piece of gear that's going to make your record amazing. It's yeah. totally your relationship to that piece of gear, what's going to inspire you mm -hmm. to do your best work. And Dave, it's like you. You want options, mm -hmm. whatever else. It, it all works, but are we just, it's clearing the path for that road. Metaphorically, when I sit yeah. down to play poker, I want to use all the cards in the deck. I don't yeah. want to start limiting myself and say, aces and pull techs count for you, but not for me. <laughs> right. I, 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 want, I want all the options, and I think that a person that truly, truly has a passion for this should learn every option, mm. and then you can seriously make decisions about what process and what equipment is best for you mm. based on where you are in terms of your ability to afford things. Not everybody yeah. can afford to work here, so, mm. so there are, there's digital options to kind of help you in that area. Mm. And, and, and it's not a right or wrong. We've heard great records, like you said, made a number of ways. And there's something else, Kevin, let's, let's expand on this later, but mm -hmm. um, there's something about limitations and, and a restriction of choices that can help make records great too. And sometimes in today's world, we have too many choices. I know because I'm the beneficiary of a lot of that excess. Mm -hmm. And when I'm looking at that drum kit, the thing that, that just really strikes home is um, two toms, one cymbal, one hi-hat, and a beat up tambourine you kind of have to make decisions real quick when you sit down behind a kit like that. And, and the decision you have to make is, I'm gonna make this thing sound like what, it, what it's capable of doing, you know? I can't, I can't rely on, on a Neil Pert size kit, you know? I've got to do it with that. If I can add, I think part of this process that Kevin's working with you know, now and is the simplicity, like he said. You, you, there's one mic, a great kit, no phase problems, you know, or, you know, there's two mics, a kick drum mic in here, but there's, there's not gonna be any phase problems there. And you, you see a lot of kits, you know, that may be more drums or not, but you see a lot of microphones, that phase makes things smaller. And it's no matter how hard you work to get rid of it, it's still gonna be there to some degree, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you listen, I bet you listen to this with, and you see this mics, and if you saw another kit here with eight mics and room mics, this will be the bigger sounding kit when you blindfold listen back because it's so simple. And I think people, if you haven't tried that technique, you gotta try it because it's, it, truly, mm -hmm. it truly is large sounding and it sounds real open and beautiful. So yeah. Agreed. that's up to you. Yeah. Okay guys, let's, uh, let's move to phase two.